good morning again, everybody. I'm Greg Crawford. I'm the local records program manager at the Library of Virginia, and um, I oversee the part of the pro uh, oversee um, the group of archivists who are responsible for uh, uh, transferring, processing, indexing, conserving uh, circuit court records that date back to the 1600s. And uh, what what we have identified in the last say 10 years is there's a lot of African American stories, not just names. There's a lot of African American names, but also a lot of African American stories that have been buried in these old records found in court, stored in courthouses for two, three hundred years. And so, as we go through, we identify these uh, records and these type of records and collections and whatnot. We're processing them, scanning them, indexing them, and thank and thanks through to y'all getting them. Uh, in uh, getting them transcribed. And I, I can't tell you how many African-American related court records have been transcribed in the last five years, but I uh, want you to know that we greatly appreciate it. The public greatly appreciate it. So we get a lot of comments on our Facebook, social media, Twitter, regarding how, how vital this, these collection, this collection is, particularly the Virginia Untold collection that relates to African-American narratives. So what I'm going to just talk about today is uh, I was asked to talk about uh, to kind of decode some of the uh, language that you I find, the types of records and the legal language and so forth that are typically found in these records. And this morning, I, there was a person in the back who's doing a transcription of a deed of emancipation and found a word I'd never heard before called uh, pretentious or something like that. Not pretentious. Uh, what was it again? Pretentious, which is an old, it was an old word to mean fake claim. So there was somebody who was writing a deed of emancipation who wanted to make sure that this individual was freed and that if anybody who had a so-called valid claim or a fake claim, which is what that word pretentious meant, that, uh, that they had no right to, to him as an enslaved person. So just found a new word today. So let's go through, let me go through some of this. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about a couple, two different record types. One is a deed of manumission, and another is deed of emancipation. They're two different types of documents, that, but the outcome is the same: is to to free an enslaved person. Uh, and if you're looking at today um, in Virginia, I'm told on the transcribed site, you still you'll find in deeds of emancipation, deeds of uh, manumission, in this in the collection to transcribe. Now, a deed of manumission is when is the act of a slaveholder who voluntarily emancipates one or more of his or her enslaved people, even though the given jurisdiction still recognizes the legal institution of slavery. So it's a, it's a legal document that they take to the courthouse to have recorded to manumit someone who is enslaved, even though there's still slavery in society, even though the government still recognizes slavery. This person has been freed. So let me give you an example of one of those documents here. Here is a gentleman named Jordan, L., uh, Jordan T. Morris. Uh, and he is manumitting, setting free from slavery. You see in highlight the word manumitted. From slavery, my wife named Maria, aged about 39 years, together with six children. Alexander, Caroline, Ida Maria, Lucy T. Jordan, and Robert all of whom reside in the county of Enrico. And I do hereby give, grant, and release unto the said Maria Morris and her children, as aforesaid, and all our future increase, all my right, tied on claim. Now you notice here, Jordan T. Morris is a free man of color. He's a free man of color who owns his, who owns his wife and children who are enslaved to him in the law, eyes of the law. This is something that was common in Virginia, but not as in the way a lot of people seem to think. Typically, when people people of color owned slaves, it was their family members. They were purchasing, they were buying them from slavery in order to ensure their protection from being sold out of the Commonwealth somewhere else. And typically, they were purchasing their family members because, like Jordan T. Morris, I'm sure probably given what I, my background on, in these records is that he was formerly enslaved. He was able to get his freedom 
But his wife, even though in Virginia, slaves were not, enslaved people could not legally marry, they still had husband-wife relationships. His wife was probably owned by a different owner. And so somehow he probably got the money together in order to purchase her and purchase his children. But in the eyes of the law, they were still enslaved. But what, I, what I'm reading into is, but I read these records, I read these stories on a practically weekly basis, that what happened here, I'm sure is, was once he purchased them, he wrote this deed of manumission, immediately went to the Henrico County Courthouse to have them manumitted or freed, no longer to be enslaved. Now, that's a manumission, so that's like an automatic, we go to the courthouse, you get freed that day. The deed of emancipation is a little bit different. The deed of emancipation occurs at a particular moment in time, namely when that transition from property deed to person occurs. Because enslaved people before 1865 were considered property. They were not, in, in, in the eyes of the government, they were property, not people. And so, in an emancipation deed, I'm going to give you an example of this, how it worked. For example, this is a deed of emancipation from the uh, city of Lynchburg involving a Torsman Lockett. Torsman Lockett was enslaved to a Dr. Hopkins when he was born. When Dr. Hopkins died, he put in his will that he wanted all his slaves emancipated. But they were not going to be emancipated the day after he died. He set time periods. In the case of Torres Mon Lockett, he could not be free, emancipated until he turned 44 years old. He was around five or six years old when Dr. Hopkins died. But he had to remain a slave until age 44. Well, his parents, who Dr. Hopkins also owned, his parents were emancipated uh, soon after he died. But their son remained enslaved to the Hopkins family. Well, a member of the Hopkins family who owned Torres Mon got into debt, and the only way he could repay the debt was to sell Torresmont at a courthouse auction in order to repay his debt. So he takes him to the Nelson County Courthouse to sell Torresmont. Torresmont's father was there watching this happen, and somehow he got the money to purchase his son. He did it so that his son, he wouldn't, didn't want to see his son go off to Richmond or off to Alabama or anywhere, you know, Mississippi, Georgia. He would never see him again. He managed to get the money to purchase his son. But, but according to the will, his son could not be freed until age 44. It's not like Torsman could, I mean, uh, Torsman's father could take his son to the courthouse the next day and give him a manumission deed and free him right then. He had to wait until his, his son turned 44. So imagine his parents, they don't see him as an enslaved person. They see him as a son. But still, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the government, he's still an enslaved person. But here, this deed of emancipation uh, is, was recorded in Lynchburg. In it, it shows that Torsman's, father, Torsman's mother went to the Lynchburg courthouse free and did this deed of emancipation because her son had just turned 44. So she had to wait 40 years before she could give him his freedom. But she finally gave him his freedom. Thankfully, his father was the one who purchased them and kept him from going off somewhere far away never be seen again. But the unfortunate thing is his father didn't live long enough to see his son free. These are the stories that y'all are bringing out through these transcriptions. These are, you know, just not names. These are people with real life stories. It's, many are tragic, but many are like this one where there's triumph and found in them. Now I'm going to now I'm going to go through some of the uh, different types of words and phrases that you, you know that are found in these documents that you're. Trying, what do these mean? What do these words mean? I'm, I'm typing these words. I'm reading this document, but there's a lot of words and terms that I'm not familiar with that we don't use today. So I did like a, a, a few, I picked out some words that, that I came across that y'all may uh, wonder what they are. First of all, there's a word in this document. This is a freedom suit. 
This is a freedom suit involving a lady named Rachel Finley. And Rachel Finley, uh, she was to, she had originally won her freedom in like 1780 in Prince William, uh, Prince George County. But before, but before she got her, she learned that she was to, could be freed. The person who owned her, who lived in Powhatan County, knowing that he was going to lose his suit, had her taken to Southwest Virginia and sold. And she spent 30, 20, 30 years in Southwest Virginia, not realized as a slave, but not realizing she should have been freed. And that she had won her freedom. But 30, 20 years later, she learned that she had, she had been freed. And so she filed suit in Wythe County Court to, win her, to get her freedom back. So she files it. And here you've got some words in her document this declaration in form of papyrus. And then there are some initials here, PQ, by this guy's name. So I'm just going to explain what some of these are. A declaration is a formal statement submitted to a court in which the writer swears that the contents are true. So Rachel in this court case is saying everything I'm saying in this court case, everything that I'm write, having written down here about what happened, about how I won my freedom in Prince George, uh, Prince George County, and how I was sold in Southwest Virginia, and everything that came with it, everything I'm saying is true that the person who now owns me should not be owning me. He knew, he knew that I had won my freedom. Therefore, I sh he should not keep, be keeping me as a slave anymore. And so some of the initials that were in there, you've got like PQ, we saw it by the individual's name. The PQ by the individual's name is a Latin term, it's pro carente, so excuse my southern Latin, uh, but I believe that's how it's pronounced, pro carente. And which means representing representing the plaintiff. So this gentleman down here, this G. Henderson, with the PQ beside it, as pro parente, saying Henderson is is the legal representative for Rachel Findley in this court case. And then there, if you see a uh, if you see a PD, that means pro defente. So it's whoever's representing the defense. Defendant. In this case, I believe the gentleman's name was John Draper, who was the defendant, who's the guy who purchased Rachel knowing that she was really should have been freed. Uh, so if you see a PD, it's representing the defendant. And in the in form of papyrus means in the manner of a pauper. Y'all know what a pauper is? P A U P E R? Yes. Yeah, that's a poor person. They don't have any money. And so. Here is saying Rachel is suing as a pauper, which means the lo that means the, the locality, the court, the local. They provide the lawyer. They provide the funds in order for her to hear this case. So, so someone who's an indigent person who who says the court costs will be waived, or some uh, or the local court will cover the cost of her defense or her uh, lawsuit. So here you got declaration in form of paupers, and it says she complains of John Draper in the custody of plea of trespass, assault, and battery. That's all legal language. That's, she's suing on the basis of the law of Virginia. The law of Virginia. She's saying this was illegal. This was an assault. This was a trespass on my freedom. Uh, I'm in, in bondage illegally. So she's suing on the basis of Virginia law to win her freedom. We're going to see in a moment a different court case is a freedom suit that's called a chancery case, which is not based on, a chancery suit is not based on the law, it's based on something else, and we'll see that in a moment. Y'all seen this word a lot and when you transcribe teste, T-E-S-T-E? -E. You see it down here and attach with, before you see some individual's names. T what that means is, is that the witness, or it's the witnessing or concluding clause in an instrument as a writ. Witness used especially formally to indicate that what follows is named as authority for what proceeds. In other words, like here, this fellow Eldridge Rollins, he's saying, I've, this is a copy. He see the, the initials there, DC after his name, that's deputy clerk. Deputy clerk. Sometimes you'll see CC, that's court clerk or county clerk. He's a legal, he's a, he's a representative of the, the courthouse. He went through the records and made a copy because this case 
was from Wythe County, Powhatan County, Prince George County. So the local clerks would make copies of court documents that were filed in the original case. And then they would get filed with this case here. So uh, they would make copies. So basically saying everything I've written down is true. I didn't change any words. I didn't make any commentary on anything. I copied word for it. Basically, he was a transcriber. He was transcribing documents back then. And by adding the word test day, he was basically saying everything that I copied or transcribed was, is true. I didn't make any changes. Then there's this word, uh, I don't even know if I can pronounce it, Sertorior. Y'all see it how it's spelled out, and it's spelled out in the documents. But it's a writ, which basically means is that the one of the individuals, one of the individuals in the suit, whether the plaintiff or defendant, is requesting that the case be moved to another court or to another locality. All right, and in the case of Rachel Finley, she made constant requests to have her freedom suit moved from with County from one court to another, or from one locale to another. In this case here, she says, your petitioner humbly hopes and prays that your honor will grant to her this sertora for the purpose of removing her said suit to the Superior Court of Law in Wythe County. She originally filed her court case in the, in the county court of Wythe County, but she's wanting it moved to a different court, the Superior Court of Law in Wythe County. Why? Because if you see, read this case, the judge kept kept putting the case off, putting the case off, delaying it to the next term, delaying it to the next term. He did that for 10 years. Because the judges who were hearing her case were friends with her owner, John Draper. So they didn't want, you know, he was like, don't give her her freedom. Just delay this and maybe she'll just stop. Maybe she'll just drop the suit. But she kept pushing and she kept pushing. And so finally she filed this petition for a writ of the C here, Sertori, in which he says, I'm not long for this life. And you can probably read it up here on this document here. She says, you know, your petitioner has between 30 and 40 descendants whose children and grandchildren, liberties of all whom depend the determination of this suit. And your petitioner is old and very infirmed, and her living cannot be much longer calculated upon. And should she die, they'll have to start this lawsuit all over again. So she was like, please move this case. She filed for this writ of sertore to move it from the circuit court to the superior court of law. Well, they didn't do it, so she filed another writ to have it moved to the general court in Richmond, like the Supreme Court of today. And then that case then, she filed another writ of sertore to have it moved to Powhatan County, where she was from originally. 30 years earlier. They finally moved the case there. The case was heard. She won her freedom. And all 30, 40 descendants won their freedom as well. So, Because once the female enslaved person wins her freedom, all her children and all descendants through her have their freedom as well. Relic. Uh, this has a little negative connotation to it. I mean, like old. Or something, but it's applied to in the, in, 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 in the in the court records. It's usually applied to the survivor of a pair of married people, whether the survivor is the husband or the wife. So it's a widow. It's another word for widow. Is what relict is, because you see here it's appearing in the evidence court that uh, Catherine Bruce, widow and relict of Andrew Bruce. Basically, the word relict is she's the surviving married partner. So that's just a legal term for that for a widow. And then there's this term ex parte. I don't know if you may, many of you came across this term. It means from the part. And it generally describes hearing held or orders, hearings held or orders made by the court at the request of one party without providing notice to or permitting argument from the opposing party. In other words, it's a petition filed by an individual in court where there is no defendant. There's no opposing party in it. It's just a single individual. And this is commonly found in uh, the in circuit court records, particularly in relation to slaves who were suing for re-enslavement or petitioning for re-enslavement. For, for example, here is an, it says ex parte absalon, 
on a petition of Absalom, a free man of color, desiring to choose Matthew Taylor as master and become his slave. Now, why in the world would someone want to go back into slavery? Y'all got any guesses why Absalom would want to, after being freed, being emancipated, have to leave the state, family, spouse? So th those are all good questions. It's not because they wanted to. It's because they had really no other options. You, you know, if you had an elderly slave, a person who was elderly, who had been a slave for 40, 50 years, they're in their 50s, 60s, they're not in great health. But according to Virginia law, once you were emancipated, you had to leave the state after one year. Well, where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go to Pennsylvania, Ohio. Or, but do they know anybody there? Can they start a life over there? For them, many of them, they, they describe the, the North as being a foreign country to them. The only life they've known is here in Virginia. All their family are here in Virginia. They may be married, to, they may have a, a, a marital relationship with an enslaved person who's not freed. And so many of these petitions, they're going into, the, the petitions for re-enslavement had nothing to do with like they enjoyed being enslaved. It had to be with the restrictions society had placed upon them. So, um, so the, a lot of these ex partes are in relation to that. Then there's the special verdict, and a, a verdict is basically a special verdict is when the judge there is some question, a point in the case uh, that needs clarification, and the judge it is not like a guilty or not guilty verdict is more or less trying to get all the, everyone on, in a consensus on a point of issue that's before the court. And so the, the, the judge will go to the jury, ask them some questions on this point, see if a consensus could be reached. And once that consensus is reached, they file what is known as a special verdict, and then they can proceed with the, tr the case till it ends. So it's usually handled in very complex court cases. And so you see it on the back how it's spelled special verdict or abbreviated. So that's some of the legal terms. Some of the, uh, also, I know I realize that many of you probably are not familiar with the history of Virginia court system. It's probably one of the most com complicated, convoluted things. I wish somebody would write a book that would be very clear on what all the courts and how they were formed and why were they formed. Uh, there is, as far as I know, there really hasn't been any research on this. But this is basically a breakdown of a genealogy chart, so to speak, of the Virginia court system going back to the 1600s. I have a physical copy up here at the front, should you want to have a physical copy of it. Or I got a hard copy of this chart. But the general court, the general court, that is like the Supreme Court in, it, in Virginia. That was the high court. And then you had the Supreme Court of Appeals right below it and then and the, that's the state general court to state court supreme supreme court of appeals is a state court then you have the special court of appeals military court of appeals also state courts high court of chancery and then superior courts of chancery and so forth the, the high court of chancery was su the supreme court of chancery and i'll explain what chancery is in a moment the so superior courts of chancery that was a district court that her chancery causes from multiple localities. So for example, the city of Lynchburg had a superior court of chancery that heard cases from uh, Amherst County, Bedford County, Campbell County, Buckingham County. So any of you here is interested in Buckingham County real, knows that a lot of Buckingham County records were destroyed in a fire after the Civil War, but a lot of their records are in these Lynchburg superior courts of chancery records. Um, then you had the district courts over here and another district court. The district court that was from 1788, 1808, that was a law court that heard uh, cases from multiple localities as well. You got superior courts of law and so forth. But they, I, I mainly are putting these up here because you see these abbreviated, like superior court of law could be abbreviated as SCL, superior courts of chancery, SCC. Uh, general Court GC. I'm not going to get into the history of this. I'm just, this is more or less having to do with the abbreviations I wanted to show you. 
uh, Cir Circuit Superior Courts of Law and Chancery, CSLC. So if you see a dip, so you, you'll have a clerk that signs their name and then they'll abbreviate out beside it like CSLC. That means Circuit Superior Court Law Chancery. Uh, district Courts would be the name of the clerk, DC, D period, C period. So mainly a lot of this has to, I want to, but doing a uh, explanation on all the courts and what they did, that's for another time. One thing you want, one court you're not seeing up here though is the county court. The county court was the very first court. They originated back in when the, there were shires, so in the 1600s, and they continue on into up to 1904. Right. Yes. Were there were ecclesiastical courts? There were, there, yes, I believe there were parish or ecclesiastical courts before the Revolutionary War. But those were not public courts. Those were church courts. Yeah. Okay. And then there's the Oyer and Terminal Courts. Oyer and Terminal Courts. Uh, that's y'all. Those of you who transcribe public claims probably came across these courts. These were special courts specifically designed to hear cases involving capital crimes involving enslaved people. Uh, they were like, these, these were not like standing courts. They were only called by the governor at certain periods involving enslaved people who were accused of murder, attempted murder, who were accused of insurrection, rebellion, revolt, conspiracy, so forth. These were, these were uh, unconstitutional courts. But the problem is that enslaved people were not seen as citizens of the United States. They were perceived as property, so they could get away with doing these courts against enslaved people, involving enslaved people. This was to basically have a quick and dirty verdict, judgment, and so forth. These cases, these courts lasted maybe four or five hours. So they brought the enslaved person who was accused of trying or murdering someone or murdering the, their owner. They would have the trial. Five individuals heard that there was no jury. It was five white men, five slave owners who heard the case. And then after hearing the case, hearing from witnesses, they allowed the enslaved person to say their piece. Did you do it or not? Defend yourself. And then they would come with the verdict. And again, there is no, there was no, uh, this is very, uh, you know, unconstitutional way of handling this. And uh, we have some Oyer and Terminer uh, references that date back to the early 1700s. Uh, and again, these individuals who heard these cases were appointed by the governor of Virginia to hear these particular types of trials. This is one from the public claims, to, just to give you an idea. There was this uh, woman named Lettuce uh, who was uh, accused of murder. She was put on trial in 1779 in Dinwiddie County before an Oyer and Terminer court. She was found guilty and was sentenced to be executed by hanging. But the fact, by the fact that she was with child at the time she was convicted, they said, let her give birth. Two months later after she gives birth, then hang her. She had no defense attorney. She had no witnesses who could speak on her behalf. In the story. These are stories that need to be told. They're tragic, but they need to be told. And then finally, uh, I'm not going, going to get into this, but there is also the Chancery Courts. The Chancery Courts had to do with matters not related to law, but matters of fairness, matters of equity, what was right, what was wrong. It had nothing to do with the law. For example, when Rachel filed, Rachel Finley filed her case, she filed it on the basis of law, that John Draper broke the law of Virginia. She should not have kept her enslaved, and she pointed out the laws that he broke to put her in illegally in slavery. Here in this case, in a Chancery case, the Cull this family here, the Cullens family, they were emancipated by the w uh, will of their owner, but the, uh, one of the sisters had died who was named in the will, but she had a daughter but who was not named in the will but was kept in slavery. The sisters were saying she should not be a slave because she was the daughter of our sister. 
Well, the problem is, in the eyes of law, they didn't recognize that because the daughter's name was not listed in the will. If her name was listed in the will, then she could be free. But because she was not in the will, her name was not included in the will, in the eyes of the law, she was not to be freed. Well, the sisters are saying that's not fair. That's not fair. So they sued on the chancery court. In the chancery court, where a case was heard with by one judge, in order to determine if it was fair for her, their niece, to be still enslaved or not. And this case is now available on Virginia, on the transcribe site. We put it up this week for y'all to transcribe and tell the Cullen sister stories and their efforts to win the freedom of their niece. And then also on Virginia Untold, there are other records that relate to the Cullen sisters that are in that chain. You've got Commonwealth calls, uh, petitions to remain, petitions for re-enslavement. All of these documents relate to that chancery cause that tell the full story. So once y'all transcribe that and put this chancery case involving the Cullen sisters on, it gets up on the untold, it gets the whole story of the Cullen sisters' efforts and what they went through in order to try to win the freedom of their niece. And if you want to know that whole story, I wrote a blog about it. You can go to Out of the Box blog, look up Cullen sisters, and you get the whole story. But I encourage you, before you read that blog, to find out what happened with their experiences, is to transcribe that chance for you It's full of emotion, of wanting to win the freedom of their niece. So with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, any questions on anything? Any questions on anything? Is Cullen spelled with an E or an I? Cullen's C-U-L-L-I-N-S. And now in the Chancery cause, you're going to see it spelled C-U-L-L-E-N-S. You're going to see it spelled C-U-L-L. It may be, have a couple of different variations, but the most common, vari common spelling in other documents is C-U-L-L-I-N-S. All right. Well, thank you all.